Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, woo! Sonic Flare is back in action. And no less with three esteemed guests, the Jazz Bums. In case you guys haven't followed uh, their meteoric rise on YouTube as the Jazz Bums, you really should. So go check out their channel, like and subscribe. Uh, I'll post a link, of course, down below so you guys can reach out to them. I'll also post a link to their Discord, which we'll all get into. But first, the one and only intro. Felipe, Mike, Chris, you guys have built a freaking show that's unbelievable, that focuses on jazz, and I am in awe of what you guys have created. Welcome to my channel, my humble channel. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Danny. You guys are awesome. We'll send you the, we'll send you the 50 bucks for that hype. Uh, after the show. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. Oh, wait, that was 50 bucks yesterday. It's 75 today. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Adjusted. Yes, exactly. That's awesome, man. How, uh, how have you guys been? It's, uh, it's been a while that we chatted all together. And I figured, you know, uh, uh, A, you know, returning the favor, you guys had me on your channel. Uh, I think it was last year. Gosh, time flies. Uh, and, you know, obviously you guys have featured so many awesome, cool guests and your channel has just exploded uh, and, and your discord. Um, and I figured, you know, it's high time that Sonic Flare gets the jazz bums on TV. So, um, yeah. you know, I'm guessing things are busy. You guys are uh, rocking it, rolling it. I mean, what's what's the scoop? What's happening? Yeah. So thanks for having us. This is this is fun. Um, so Chris Felipe and I have the Jazz Bums YouTube channel. Um, it's kind of a, it's kind of like multifaceted. So we do structured interviews. Um, we highlight certain aspects of record collecting and jazz music. Um, and we also have a Friday live stream where it's really kind of a community um, interactive space. God, what am I doing? I'm such a moron. Ugh. So uh, we have a you know a, a host of, of people that come join us there who are super knowledgeable um, and friendly, and it's it's just a fun uh, environment. So um, we've been kind of just honing that, working that, and uh, taking you know the opportunities that come up to speak with uh, like jazz artists that we're interested in, and just learning about the music. And it, it's really been a, a fun way to interact with. Uh, with the music in the hobby, um, you know, this year I've been making some, you know, modest upgrades to my system. So we we get a little bit into the gear piece. Felipe knows more about that than uh, than I do for sure. Um, but yeah, it's a uh, it's it's really kind of a fun, positive environment that we try to create for everybody. And um, and yeah, so thanks for having us. This this is really uh this is really cool. Absolutely love it. No, you know, look, I mean, I've always said. Uh, so I'm definitely on the music side of the, you know, audiophile spectrum, if you want to call it that, um, you know, without music, none of this stuff matters. Right. And so I'm definitely music first, uh, even though I, I, I love the gear. I mean, who doesn't? But, you know, it's it's I always chuckle when I see folks with, you know, crazy systems and then they show me like their five records and I'm like, OK. So anyway, um, Chris, what's uh, what? How did you get connected with Mike and Felipe and all that? What's what's the story? Oh, yeah, that's a fun story. So I'll go a little farther back. So like in the pandemic, like a lot of people, I broke up my record player that I'd had in a closet for a while. You know, I, I collected some records in the early 2010s. I probably had about four or five hundred like rock records. You know. And then I just kind of get bored with it and put my turntable in the closet. Well, once the pandemic hit, I was just sitting in here one day and I realized, hey, I could just set up a turntable and listen to my records. And I did. Then I bought a, a couple of jazz records and that was kind of the end of everything else, right? Like I haven't bought, I've only bought jazz ever since 2020. So no way. Wow. I mean, well, I mean, I, you know, I buy a few other records, but sure. I, probably bought, you know, I, probably, I probably bought a couple thousand records in that time and I'd say 90. Eight percent of them are jazz. Wow. Um, so anyway, me and Felipe and Mike, we all met on uh, Ken McAuliffe's um, Jazz Vinyl Lovers Facebook page, right? Yep. 
And then me and Felipe started, you know, messaging each other. And I think him and Mike had, were messaging each other for a while. And then they invited me to a, a group chat. And they're like, hey, we should start a YouTube channel. So I was like, <laughs> okay. And I think we created it. And then we didn't actually do anything with it for four or five months. Yeah. We like um, created the channel. And then we just kind of were just talking. And one of the fun things we used to do, which I'd like to get back to at some point, um, which I thought was fun, was we'd listen to the same records together. Yes. Oh, yeah. like, like separately, you know, just in the messaging cool each yep. other about it. Oh, and, uh, interesting. So interesting. that's kind of how it started. And then we started kind of recording those videos, doing, you mm -hmm. know, talking about whatever, you know. That's awesome. Yeah. 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 Felipe. Yeah. Um, I think that was pretty much, yeah, how it started. Uh, for me, I. I came from Brazil, of course, uh, been here for about 20 years. Next year is going to be my 20th uh, anniversary in the U.S. I I was always fascinated by by hi-fis and, and records. I think since I was like five or six, I was buying seven inches because we couldn't afford buy records back then in the 80s. Yeah. A record is like a happening. You buy one like once a year, once every two years. So I had like lots of seven inches cassette tapes. They were half the price. And I was always listening, listening, and buying stuff. And and there was no internet, so I was reading as much as I could, buying magazines whenever they would pop up, and and just building up, building up, building up, and, and I never stopped. Uh, I went through many different phases, but in the 2000s, 90s, I was still buying my records and people making fun of me, but I was still keep going. And then eventually, after I moved here, I kept investing in my gear and. And getting my getting my records back here with me. I still have some uh, some stuff back in Brazil. Okay. Uh, I've been building my system over the years. I'm quite happy with it now. And and that was it. I think um, lockdown times were just okay. Uh, what we can do? And we were watching a lot of YouTube. We had nothing to do, right? So whatever. And I was chatting with Mike about jazz and Frank Sinatra, or whatever. I was chatting with Chris about Pro Jam and stuff like that. And, and then the idea came to to do the channel because there was it, it could be fun uh, uh, and and I think that the trio format was cool. Um, there's a podcast I love back back home. That's, it's in three as well, and uh, they always like arguing, discussing, talking. I think that that would be a nice touch to have always a different uh, angle, point of view, and uh, yeah, multifaceted as, as Mike pointed. I think that that, that that was the fun of it, and and I think the three of us literally like there, there's like no. We just have this fucking attitude. There's no ego. There's no nothing there. We just have fun. It's it's always about having fun. Nothing else. Yeah, yeah. You're not you're not looking to drive revenue. You're not looking to, you know, create clicks. You're just you know open minded. Let's have a discussion. Let's chat. Um, mm -hmm. YouTube. So I've got my opinions on it. Um. What is the like the the one thing that you guys have noticed standing out the most on YouTube today versus when you guys got started? Mm. Well, live streams are definitely becoming more popular um, okay. within uh, the record collecting um, channels. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people like the format, and it's a way for channels to have crossover. Um, as well, and share knowledge, bring other experts on. So that's that's definitely been something that was around for sure, but it's it's getting much more popular. Mm -hmm. um, I think also the viewership really likes it. It's more conversational. It's mm -hmm. fun. You can interact in the chat um, in real time. Yeah. So that like that adds like a, a level of engagement with the, with the viewer that wasn't there necessarily with just traditional videos. Yeah. Um, so it's really fun. Um, and we, uh, you know, we do a live stream on Fridays at 8 p.m. Eastern, and it usually goes for four hours. It can go up. I mean, Chris has like stayed on for like eight hours or <laughs> it, it really is just like who comes up, what the conversation is. It's like a hang, you know, like yeah. grab a drink, come hang out. Um, we generally, you know, if, you know, if you're cool, you can come up on screen and chat, show records. You could stay up for five minutes. You could stay up for five hours. It's, you know, it, it's, it's pretty much, you know, open door as long as you're cool. You know, yep. just you know, don't cause any trouble. You're totally fine to to come hang out. So we've we've really kind of developed a lot of good friendships um, with uh, with a lot of other collectors. And one thing, you know, before I started reaching out, you know, on social media, on on Facebook, 
Um, it, you know, I didn't really have like a core base. I had, you know, a couple record stores that I'd be able to go and interact with people and talk about music face to face, mm -hmm. but this has really made it more about a community feel. So for, for a, you know, I'm, I'm more extroverted. So for me, that's kind of an important thing to be able to add to the hobby and it makes me, you know, more interested and more passionate. So, um, so it's been really, you know, a positive thing, um, overall. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, nice. One of the interesting things I, I we I think we've learned, <clears throat> and it's kind of just you know upsetting at times is what people actually care about watching, mm -hmm. right? Okay. Yes, because yeah. we'll do a video. We'll, we've done interviews with people that are just these amazing current jazz musicians, you know, that are doing really important stuff, and no one cares, right? Like yeah, you'll get you'll get like three hundred views on a video with with some amazing jazz artists and then you do a i don't know a 10 we did one of our biggest videos recently this was last, probably six months ago we, joe harley came out and said hey we're gonna do some capital records on the tone poet series right and we're like okay yeah. let's talk about it and we just like bullshitted our way through like an hour of maybe they'll do this and maybe they'll do that and they got you know like tons of views so interesting it's it's, it's interesting figuring out what the, the people actually want to see and you know and then also we just do what we want. I mean, that's one of the things with our channel too. Like we don't really, I mean, we have, I think Mike's thumbnails got half our audience just because they're so awesome looking. <laughs> but like once you start watching our videos, I'm not sure that they kind of hold up to the thumbnails sometimes as far as like the production quality and everything, you know, but uh, yeah, it, it's, it's been fun. It's, um, I don't know. It's, it, it also helped me through the pandemic, just the friendships that I've, developed with these two guys um we talk every day um wow. pretty much constantly through messenger and then you know phone calls yeah. three four times a week happen so you know it's it's nice to be able to develop what i think are going to be a couple of lifelong friends basically back to teenage years <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Too funny yeah. yeah no i i noticed um you know as i'm sort of developing my own content for, for the channel, it's always, you know, gosh, what are people going to watch? And to your point, you know, sometimes the topics um, kind of drive themselves mm -hmm. and, and they develop their own life force, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And they totally end up being the exact opposite of what you thought it was going to end up being. Um, so like, you know, for example, yesterday's, uh, it was kind of funny to, and on point, I guess, yesterday's video I, I, you know, talked a little bit about the high-end show in Munich uh, that took place last week. It's the biggest hi-fi show in the world. Uh, something like 23,000 people visited last uh, last time. And, you know, my, my opinions on it are, are basically based on, you know, 25 years of experience in, in this hobby and looking at things from a different perspective. And, man... The flack that I'm getting in my text messages for people. All right, dude, why are you dissing the show? What's wrong with you? It's so awesome. But that, I'm like, oh my gosh, man, are you serious? That's hilarious, you know? So I totally get it. I, I Sometimes it's, you know, things come from left field and you're like, okay, I, you know, wow. Anyway, Felipe, you were going to say something earlier. No, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think interaction too. Uh, we, we got comments on the video sometimes. I said, dude, what's this guy thinking? Right? They take it so serious, so passionate. And uh, I, I mean, yeah, I, I, I sometimes I go to some masters like to elaborate and say, you know, say something nice and always kind of agree but disagree, and then uh, you know, nothing goes on. Yeah, because hey. I, I think, yeah, I think it's just a matter of you know, uh, people having their opinions and uh, yeah, know, and I think that there's no right or wrong. So that, that's a cool thing. With some people, I mean, there, there's people um, that, I, that I know, I interact, I chat or exchange emails, and I see the comments, I say, dude, what are you serious what you're talking about? <laughs> but, but, you know, I think anything goes. And, uh, and I think on, on uh, just uh, wrapping up on, on the whole YouTube experience, I think what makes us, like, not getting fatigued or doing this is because we just do everything, so many different things. We have, like, no, like, structure for doing this, doing that, and. Uh, you know, they have the streams. If, if um, you know, I'm I like like going deeper and reading, researching about something. I think it has to do with my academic background. I like to you know 
to like a more academic kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But you know, I do it when I have the time, when I feel like doing it, and uh, you know, and if, if it makes sense. And the streams are a lot of fun, I think. Um, in terms of, like deep content, it's not the ideal, but in terms of, like chatting and exchanging experiences, I think it's, it's just great, and we get people from from all over. But I think just wrapping up, Danny, uh, from 2020, it's something that Chad mentioned when he talked to us, and I think I agree to a certain point, mm -hmm. is that things got a little more fragmented. I think, I think in 2021, everybody was doing videos together, everybody, you know, and now I think kind of uh, split up a little bit, yeah. not in a bad way, just people finding their trends and the niches and, and their paths. Yeah. And just follow. I think it's, it's different. It doesn't feel or at least look so unified as it used to be, which is not a bad thing. It's just different. I, I completely agree with that. I'm glad you brought that up. That's definitely something I noticed as well, where, you know, it, it, it's like it, it it's created its own clicks, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Speaking of clicks, um, Discord, God, oh, yeah. you guys have like created a forum. That is unbelievable. I mean, I've got yeah. my, you know, five or six guys that post regularly, right? It's it's almost like I, I every now and then I keep thinking, I'm like, we should just switch to Messenger, right? What, what, <laughs> right. What even is this going on, right? <laughs> um, but, you know, you guys have catapulted that category. And I think it's awesome. I mean, even though I don't post much, um, I do read up and what a community you've built incredible what's what's yeah. the story behind that how did that come about well uh we were we basically saw other you know other people establish discords and we just thought you know that this might be something we can do so um i put a discord together for jazz bums the jazz bum server i shared it with felipe chris uh mike notes and tones i think and and rob and mazzy i think those were like the first people to join and we just started promoting it on the live stream and what's nice is there is like if you come to the live stream and you look at like what's happening in the chat there are regulars there that are communicating on our stream they go to other streams you know they're you know they're friends so yeah. this this created an environment for them to join and they just kind of continue that conversation and mm -hmm. and it it is you know it's obviously jazz bum server it's it is largely jazz focused it's largely vinyl focused but it's certain it is definitely not limited to a format um or i mean we also have non-jazz topics i mean if, if somebody has an idea like uh I, I forget who it was, um, but somebody was like, let's start like a birding, like a, a, a birding yeah. channel. And, yeah. and you know, there are birders that go in there and chat. I mean, that's a small little segment. It doesn't get that much, but it's just, you know, there's a lot of good options in there and you can kind of connect with people. And um, I feel like everybody, you know, has their favorite channels. Like I am obsessed with, we have an eBay and Discogs uh, page. So when I'm searching, if I see a good deal um, yeah. on something that I'm not interested in buying, I just post it in there. Um, and share it with people and people get, you know, people buy it, like if, they, if they're interested in it as well. So, so that I feel like is super useful. We've connected with a lot of other channels have joined and we have, you know, if you post a new video, there's a new video channel where people yeah. will post um, and help promote that piece and people can talk about it. So um, those mm -hmm. have been really cool. Like the other YouTubers that have come on to the discord, I think is really, really awesome. Um, and we're so happy that, you know, people are, are enjoying it. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Good point. Um, and and uh, the 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 eBay link and this this Cogs link that's a brilliant idea. Um, you know, I, yeah. I often pick up. I mean, hell, most of the stuff that I pick up is from recommendations what others are listening to, right? And Same. so, you know, it's it's great to have a, a forum where you can explore that from people that you trust and people that, you know, even though you may know, not know them in person, um, obviously are, are experts in the field, so to speak, and make recommendations. So good stuff. Yeah, yeah. It's been really interesting to me. Um, we, had, we had kind of talked about it before Mike set it up a little bit, because the thing about YouTube is it's very difficult to really have a community, mm -hmm. right? There's no, I mean, you can, there's like a community tab that no one uses. You know, you can like make a post, and I mean, it's just not the same, right? Yeah. And we didn't want to do another Facebook group because we thought right. that was kind of played out, you know. So, 
um, it's been pretty amazing. I mean, it's how we keep in touch with all of our, all of our, you know, viewers and friends and, um, yeah, it's just been really cool. It's cool. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think yeah, that, that was a great point, Chris. When the whole idea started, uh, I think there was, you know, uh, so, some other discord, uh, things starting and, you know, so you hear good things, you hear bad things. I was like, when Mike came back, yes, it, fuck no. <laughs> I, I I don't want to be like you know dealing with uh, adults having you know crisis of uh, dramas and uh, dude come on, but uh, it, it just grew up so well. Everybody has been so so cool. Always like nice discussions. I think we had like one or two, not even like big deals, and then you know didn't derange it to anything. Yeah, and uh, it's it's been terrific. I mean, I, I've got to meet a lot of people there too. Uh, there's like buy and sell there's birding yeah there's everything there's like garden uh, what, what else pets and the cat house yeah. whatever <laughs> you know and uh, it's always very there's mu there are music channels too there's a bunch yeah. of music channels, yeah. oh good to know <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we could, yeah we even like broke down by cities right people that are in a yeah. specific saw city that. yes they, they, yeah. they can hang out and uh they, they can meet each other or, or exchange yeah, yeah. uh you know tips on uh, where to go where to drink uh, which uh nightclub or or a record store or anything so yeah that, that's awesome that's really really cool it really is i mean i i'm not kidding seriously you guys have built a community that i, I mean honestly i can't think of any other youtube channel that has developed their own discord that has anything like it um as far as community and and, and stuff and you know you mentioned it felipe earlier um you know, I, I'm not noticing the usual sort of isms on there either, right? You, you've got yeah. all the idiots out there, um, and, and I just don't see that, right? It, it seems like everybody, no. you know, I don't know if you guys are maybe moderating behind the scenes, and that's why I don't see that stuff. No, um, no. not really. I mean, no. we're it starts with the live streams. We're like we're there to have fun. We don't really get political or anything like that. I mean, maybe like if we've been on 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 for six hours and I'm I'm super loaded or something, that's happened a couple of times. Or whatever, right? <laughs> if you watch the show for six hours, you're up for anything at that point, right? But pretty much, um, we don't really just don't put up with with BS. Like, yeah. if, if you come on our live stream and start just attacking people or just being a dick for no reason, I'll just ban you. We'll ban you instantly, and then yeah. you know that's it. Yeah. And the Discord, we've yeah. never had to ban a single person because. Wow, it just doesn't. Awesome. I don't know. We just it's just all music focused or these whatever other hobbies people want to talk about. And I think people are there to escape mm -hmm. a lot of the toxicity you see in, in the other, you know, other yeah. spaces. Yeah, yeah. agreed. Oh, yeah. Um, there isn't a day that goes by where my YouTube algorithm pops up a new music channel or hi-fi channel, or music hi-fi channel, or whatever. Is it me? Or is, is like everybody doing videos now on YouTube? Yeah, there, there's definitely a lot of people. Um, and there's a lot of new people. And there's some of the new people are some of my like favorite channels to watch now. I, I feel like a lot of times, in, especially when people first start and they're kind of navigating it, um, you know, like our production isn't isn't good. It's it's basically like it's it's you know like a like a stream yard. Like we have, oh, right? We each have, we each have our different room setups. We have different lighting. Like it, 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 I think, but I think the audience is um, forgiving with that. Um, we do get sometimes if the audio is messed up, the people will comment. But other than that, it's really you know not a big deal for people mm -hmm. because it's really about um content and the conversation yeah. more than you know uh the best production quality although we would love to you know have nice production too mm -hmm. um the reason why i mention that is because new channels um sometimes they're not really well produced but like the when when somebody starts and they kind of jump through mm -hmm. that first hoop it's like they are doing it because they're passionate and mm -hmm. it's interesting to see what they care about and how they frame things how they talk about things and then watching them evolve so i have you know yeah so i have, I have a few new ones that i really like one thing I did want to mention, um, though, is one of the benefits of the Jazz Bums channel is that it, there are three people. So if I can't make a live stream, the live stream can still happen because Felipe and Chris can run it. Or if we don't have um, a video to post, Felipe might have some research and put together 
a video on an artist. Mm -hmm. So we're able to kind of divide and conquer and then come together when when we're all able to. So yeah. And we we also like like um like Felipe does a lot of the relationship management with our interviews. Um, I'll do the the thumbnails. Chris does the video editing. So we're able to also divide like the the work. So it it really is like a, a great setup um, for us that allows us to kind of be you know productive, yeah. um, and not not be totally overwhelmed because it can definitely feel like you know once you're editing, thinking of content, if you're scripting something out because you want to do like a form a more structured video, like it does. Like Felipe said, it takes a lot of time. So having like uh, you know two other people to help support that is is really an awesome thing. So yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, interesting uh, points you bring up. Um, I, I think most people jump into YouTube not really aware of what it takes to create professional-looking content, right? From from some of the obviously the big YouTubers that are out there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I follow a lot of the the tech channel guys. I follow a lot of the photography guys, the video guys. Uh, some of the car guys and gosh, I mean, you know, you look behind the scenes and I mean, they're bona fide TV production companies basically doing the job. Right. Mm -hmm. oh, for sure. um, and then, you know, Mike, you mentioned the, the editing part. So I just um, gosh, it was probably right around the new year is when I ditched iMovie uh, and went to Final Cut Pro exclusively. Right. And I, I just sort of ran against the, uh, I guess, the edge of and the limits of, of what you can do with iMovie um, with regards to, you know, obviously just some of the, the, the more, you know, professional looking things that you can do with with Final Cut. Um, but it's a lot of work, man. It's all self-taught. Right. I mean, I, I yeah. you know, I'm not paying anyone to do any of my editing. I'm doing it all myself. I do all my own camera work. And man, it you know, I tell you, it's doing the B-roll stuff. It really starts adding up how much you know. Basically, I mean, I can tell you right now, if I do a a moderately um, playful intro video, you're looking at a day and a half, two days of work. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, from the filming to reshooting it to the lighting to this to that to the other to the editing part man it it really takes up a lot of time and so i think you know the 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 new guys coming in uh and, and every now and then i'll i'll get a random question from someone hey you know i'm thinking about starting you know what, what do you think i should pay attention to and i'm like oh geez you know here we go with everything you. yeah you know everything. everything matters to everyone all the time <laughs> <laughs> um no it's true yeah i'm i'm still using for my videos when i when i make them i'm still on iMovie it was a self-learned process as well yeah. uh, i'm still sometimes i think about final cut but I'm not, i don't think i'm there yet do it do it <laughs> you'll love it you know here's the thing man the I, i'll tell you the learning curve was pretty damn steep um you know, just and and by, I'm by no means like any kind of a tech expert. Um, the learning curve is pretty steep, but once you figure it out, it's so much quicker and easier to do edits than it is with iMovie. Uh, mm. So do it. <laughs> that's that's <easy. laughs> Yeah, I, I use Shotcut um, to edit our videos. It's free. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's been around forever. We don't do a lot of real fancy editing, though. I mean, it's mostly to cut out awkward pauses and, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. me yeah. saying um like six times before I get to the point or something, you know. Right. Yeah. Now, what, what, one of the fun things is when we do interviews, um, there we go. My favorite, some of my favorite interviews or our favorite interviews are when the, the person we're interviewing talks 90% of the time. Yeah. Right. Like we like to, prompt them for cool stories or whatever information we're, we're wanting mm -hmm. to share with the audience yeah. Well, yeah. without having to poke and prod them to, to give us the answers, you know, what's so those been, are much easier to edit. Cause it's like, okay, the guy just talked about this awesome subject for five minutes. Cool. So that's five minutes in the can versus, you know, if someone, um, you ask them a question and they give you a three sentence answer, you're like, uh, okay. Right. 
Yeah. Right, come on, keep going. You you have to have a little bit of um, an ability to speak in front of a camera. I'm noticing that. Uh, in mm-hmm. fact, I've, I've just a couple of weeks ago, I actually canceled a video that I was doing with a person. I'm like, dude, you just, you know, the camera is your friend. You know, I'm trying to be like as animated as possible to help them out. And it mm-hmm. just wasn't working. Right. And um, so, yeah, I get it. You, you have to have a little bit of a comfort, um, which brings me to. What was your favorite interview that you guys have done so far? Hmm. Hmm. That's hard. Hard. First yeah. off, I got to remember them all. Yeah. Well, you've done yeah. a lot. You've done one a lot. Of, one of the the biggest interview, probably because it was our first interview, we we were able to get Joe Harley on, and that was just so huge for us that he would give give us his time, and that would. You know, and he has great stories too. I mean, he was a great subject. So, Legend. and we're like, you know, we're all into Blue Note Tone Poets. Like, it was just a just a, an exciting opportunity to be able to chat with them. So that that was definitely a huge one. And then I think for artists, I really thought it was cool to uh, speak with Ray Angry, um, mm-hmm. who is the um, piano player uh, in the Roots, works with Questlove uh, on the Tonight Show with Jimmy Fallon. Um, he put out. Uh, a few records on this label JMI mm-hmm. and uh, we were able to get um, you know a couple interviews with the with the producers of JMI and and Ray Angry and that that was so cool to chat mm-hmm. with them too yeah, yeah yeah there's still more to come right yeah yeah <laughs> but, but um, yeah oh go ahead Chris I'll go after you um, I mean beyond the ones that, that Mike talked about I, I thought the one of the first the first artist interview we did I think was with Anthony Wilson um, yes. for the Hackensack West. It was about yeah. uh, a couple months before the record came out. And so we got to talk with him and Joe and Kevin about the whole production and all that. And they shared a couple of, of files from the record that we got to share on our video so people could listen to them. It was kind of like the first, you mm-hmm. know, examples for people to listen to. So that was really amazing. We felt really honored that those guys, yeah. you know, thought we were cool enough and had enough of an audience to, to do that. That was neat. And then um, talking to Chad was really awesome too. And the thing, the, the big thing I took away from him um, was like, I knew he was passionate before that, just from seeing him, but talking to that guy, his passion and obsession for vinyl and music just really came through. And it, it was it, it kind mm-hmm. of amazing. Yeah. 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 He's an institution. I mean, there, there's, there's no way of, of yes. slicing and dicing it. I mean, you know, he, he, uh, he bears a considerable weight um, in in mm-hmm. this hobby of ours, right? With all the reissues, obviously. Um, yeah. yeah, interesting, interesting. Mm-hmm. Felipe, yeah. um, just I would double on Chris on, on Chad. I, I think uh, it was nice. Of course, we, just like here, we we talk a lot off screen, and uh, it was kind of interesting to to grasp a little uh, more of, of his of his brain. You know, pick up his brain on. on other issues and see how things actually work mm-hmm. because it's easy for everybody to go on live stream. Hey, Chad, do this, do that. And say, dude, give yeah. me, you know, yes. it, 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 it's not that simple. Right. And uh, just to learn that this Atlantic series took like five years to be built. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It, it, it's, it's impressive. I, I, I would never suspect it. Um, so in, in terms of interviews, there's, um, there's some that I particularly like because I think the, um, the interviewers are so passionate, right? So uh, I think Max Girl, the last one that we, we had, mm-hmm. that guy, and we want to talk to him again because he had so many stories okay. to tell. Yeah. It was it was really cool. Uh, I, I like to talk to, to, to Jerome Sabah, uh, especially, you know, he's building a label as well. The guy's like, you know, his own way. He's not only working on the musician side so passionately, but also... Um, you know, on the industry, he wants to push the industry forward, which mm-hmm. I, I, I think was pretty cool of him. Mm-hmm. And, and yeah, I, I think those are some that really caught my attention on, on the on the terms that were like so so passionate and, and into it. I, I I truly liked and appreciate those interviews. And it's cool, you know. And, and I, I don't I don't even mention Joe because 
those guys, him and Kevin, they're so open. They're so available to us, you know. Approachable. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you can just text them or whatever. They're going to reply to you, you know. Yeah. For it's, sure. It's, it's just amazing. I mean. Yeah. He, he, I like yeah. the one you guys did with Kevin Gray, too. Uh, that oh, was yeah. a while ago. Uh, yeah. But one, one of my favorite uh, uh, one of my favorite guys uh, in the industry, period. And he happens to be a great mastering engineer. So, um yeah, keep keep it up, keep it up. I love uh, I love seeing what you guys are developing, and and obviously, no doubt, as as the channel grows, your influence will grow, and with it, you know, the talent you'll be able to attract. Any any uh, any big stars that you guys want to hook and and get on the channel? Any any uh, anyone oh, yeah. you want to disclose? Oh, well, yeah. I mean, in terms of artists, we would love to do like Ron Carter, I, that's probably never going to happen. We've yeah. reached out to him before and his people were very nice in telling us it's not going to happen. Right. But they did say if we ever went to a show that, you know, reach out and we mm -hmm. can, uh, we can talk to him backstage or whatever. So yeah. Yeah. maybe, yeah. maybe one day we could do something like that, but I would love to do like quest love. That would be amazing to get. I'd love to speak with him. So, um, yeah. Yeah. A couple of things too, that, that has been interesting. We were, I don't know. Let's say we, I was very anxious to talk to these artists because I'm not a musician. Mm -hmm. You know, I listen to jazz constantly, but I'm still so new that it's like one of the challenges for me that I've been working on. And I think I probably will till the day I die is understanding what I'm actually listening to. Mm -hmm. But why is this different than something else? Right. Like, what are they doing here? It's so innovative. You know, like if you have a record of, Oh, this was such a big record when it came out, cause it changed the, mm -hmm. the music and really kind of understanding what those differences are and, and being an intelligent listener, right? Mm -hmm. But for the interviews, one of the things I think separates us, maybe not from other folks, but that alleviates people's concerns is we're never trying to, to get a gotcha moment on someone, like with drama or anything else. We're never trying to give get them to give us, you know, secret information so we can break news or whatever. Like, we don't care about that. I mean, if they do, it's awesome. Like Chad mm -hmm. on our interview gave us a couple of tidbits of things he was going to be releasing, which was freaking cool. But we're not just, you know, I feel like a lot of times when you see these guys being interviewed, they have to be very kind of close to the vest yes. so they don't get sucked into, into, you know, giving away secret information or whatever. Right. Yeah. I think that's, you know, one of the things we've always tried to to be very um, straightforward with the folks we're going to interview. And we tell them before, like, hey, if you misspeak or something, we can edit it out. If you share something and, and at the end of the interview you think you don't want to share it, we'll edit it out. Like, you have full editorial control. Mm -hmm. You know, because we're not trying to get clicks because somebody said something controversial or yeah, or we, re we revealed this information. You know, yeah, yeah, that, that makes sense. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, uh, so then, just one thing I forgot. I think is important. Uh, a guy that we interviewed twice. I think uh, it, it's very, very important to mention Zeb Feldman. He's always mm -hmm. so being very yes. kind, generous, open to us. Yes. I mean, uh, this guy yeah. has been like such a, a force in what he does. And he's been so open and accessible to us as well, you know, via text, messenger or Instagram, whatever, YouTube, whatever. He is something that someone that really is even more recognition than what they have, you know. And uh, I really thank him for, for all the support he's been given to us and being so open and kind. Great point. Yeah, I mean, come on. Uh, you know, obviously, I think his claim to fame, at, at, you know, however uh, limited vision that may be is, is really, I think from the RSD stuff that he's been doing, mm -hmm. but I mean, he's, I mean, he's a legend. He's like Joe Harley. I mean, he's, mm -hmm. you know, he's behind the scenes. I mean, he's a, a monolith, right? I mean, he's, he's, yeah. uh, you know, the, the, the work that he's been involved in and the artists that he's been supporting and working with, I mean, holy shit, man, crazy mm -hmm. stuff. So yeah, good good call. Yeah, yeah. The the unspoken heroes of of the industry. <laughs> yeah, because we we might just think about RSD, but he probably wrote like a roadmap for how we should should, have, totally. should, should be done. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. No no doubt. Yeah. Um, speaking of reissues, so uh, reissues, uh, jazz stuff keeps coming out. Joe and Kevin are pumping out those titles. Uh, you know, Chad, obviously, with the Atlantic 75 series, Rhino is doing their stuff. 
Uh, Impex has been on a roll lately. Um, gosh, is there any end in sight for any of this? I I mean, I love it. I cherry pick the title, the titles that I want. Um, and like, I think it was recently announced that they're doing Mal Waldron's The Quest. That's mm -hmm. a new jazz title. That is a great pick. Um, like those, those types of uh, difficult to find in good condition, expensive records. Um, it's great that, you know, you have folks at Kraft um, and, you know, at Blue Note um, and the, the, the stewards of these great jazz catalogs going back and, uh, and putting stuff out. And yeah, Chad's also included there. He has the contemporary reissue series, Pablo. So he's doing really cool stuff too. Um, and I do feel like my own collecting is a balance between uh, the fun of searching for the original pressing. Um, you know, there's there's nothing like finding like a, a great record in great shape for a great price. I, I, you know, it's really fun to do that. And then also balancing out with like this audio file, put it through Kevin's yeah. uh, chain. Let's see how that sucker sounds. Um, that's fun too. But yeah, I mean, in terms of volume, there's a lot of titles coming out, um, but it's fun. You know, I am always interested in seeing, you know, what's com what's coming out and uh, and what titles are doing. Yeah, I, I probably buy more reissues than Felipe and Mike. Maybe, mm -hmm. maybe not. I don't know. I feel like I probably do. Um, I, I love them. I mean, the, the 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 good series like the Tome Poets and the Classic series and all the stuff Chad does. Um, one thing I'm not interested in, and I feel like a lot of the Consumers are not that interested in them. There's a, there's a, there's a segment that is is the hundred and fifty dollar records. Mm -hmm. right? I mean, I think they do well. Like the one steps and, and the UHQRs that Chad does. There's like a certain segment of people that are going to buy those, and, and that's great. But they're just not for me. I would rather have, mm -hmm. you know, six tone poets than you know one UHQR personally. Yeah. Um, beyond that, it's like you can't keep up with everything, and you shouldn't try. I mean, if you want, if you're just that's like your whole thing. You just want to buy everything. That's fine. But like, I feel like me and Felipe specifically really tried to do that early on with the tone poets and the classics. And, 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 and there was so much FOMO. Everybody was scared that it's going to sell out and you're never going to get it again. The lesson I learned is everything comes back. It may not be the exact release version you saw this time, but in four yes. years, yeah. if it's a popular title, they're going to reissue that thing again. Like these companies are going to be doing this until no one wants to buy them again. Right. So, <laughs> It's just, Agreed. I mean, they've been doing it since, I mean, Blue Note was reissuing stuff in the 50s. Like yeah, they exactly. The record and, and, hey, and that record 70s, sold. And in the 70s. It. And yeah, in the 80s. Exactly. Yes. 100%, so. And in the 90s. Yeah. But I get the flip side, too. There's plenty of people that are more interested in just buying original copies of things and having that history and, and that sort of thing. Prices have gone through the roof yeah, um, on, on the OG stuff. It, it, it's literally... I, I don't think I've ever seen prices like they are today. Um, I forgot what I was watching not, not too long ago. Um, it may have been Mazzy or something. You know, remember the famous dollar bin records? And, you know, you could go through them and you'd find, you know, a, 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 a diamond in the rough. Dude, those days are gone. Yeah. The, the oh, dollar sure. bin stuff, I don't even look at that. I don't even go near it. It's crap. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, so it's definitely, you know, the original stuff is, is becoming even more collectible. Mm -hmm. um, regardless of whether or not there's a reissue on it, right? Mm -hmm. Right. You know, yes. you know, in the past, it sort of used to be that, you know, a reissue of a title comes out that's famous. And it's like, okay, well, you know, you kind of see a little bit of a drop, but you don't see that anymore at all. No. Um, which, you know, yeah, go figure. Um, and, and there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of uh, originals that are pretty shitty sounding and still cost a fortune. So no, again, yeah, no doubt. Absolutely true. Right. No doubt. Yeah. The, the um, off the jazz topic, I've been uh, picking up the uh, new Deutsch gramophone original source series. Yes. Those are spec. Those are like fantastic. And when you compare them to the originals, which I have, a, you know, I have a few originals as well. Yeah. Um, there, there's a substantial difference in in uh, yes. the, the sound quality. So that's a great series um, for people like myself who are kind of just getting into classical and uh, mm -hmm. 
and here, you know, also these reissues allow people to like start conversations. So um, there's a, there's a few channels like Poetry on Plastic um, and he'll have like guests on, Mark Ward he'll bring on and uh, also Mark Ward's channel. I forget the name of it right now, but you know, they'll go into these DGs and when they do this, they'll compare like this performance against like 10 others, give yep. all the context and it's just, a, you know, it's just fun to, to learn about that stuff. So it also allows for those conversations to happen. Agreed. You know, funny you bring that up. Um, I, I think in the grand scheme of things, of reissues, I think the DG reissue series is likely, in my humble opinion, the biggest one that we've had over the last maybe 10 years. I, I think it's the one that has made the most impact on the sound and the sound quality mm. that you're getting and um, on the accessibility. Uh, I, I think that they really nailed it. Exactly. And the thing I love about it is that it came from nowhere, mm -hmm. right? I mean, there was no, you know, pre-announcement there was no like you know anticipation building up years in advance oh we're gonna be doing something it's like you know i i, I mean as far as i remember they yeah. kind of just showed up right yeah um and and you know i i haven't bought every single one of them uh just because you know obviously with classical just like any other music you know you're kind of selective as to okay this is i care about this i don't but i tell you and i completely echo your point mike the quality of the reissue, the sound quality, it spanks the originals by a mile. It's not even close. So I think from, from, from a reissue perspective, that's the one that really caught my attention um, and, and produced the most significant changes uh, mm -hmm. that, that I can remember. And they're only getting better. So, yeah, I mean, I yeah. just got the last batch um i can't wait for the brookner box set that's going to be epic yeah. um so anyway a little off topic from the jazz bums uh but yeah. sorry everybody <laughs> all good all good hey. I, I, I think it's probably like uh i'm not saying in a bad way it's like the least redundant of the reissue series mm -hmm. because let's say let's talk blue notes you can go buy a nice 80s japanese copy it's going to be amazing you don't yep. need to be buying something that's being done now you know, yeah, I'm not dismissing what's being done now, but you cannot buy any other pressings or versions of this classical music. But there's as none, everything's yeah. crap. Agreed. Right. Agreed. You know, there's a, a couple, couple of things I want to add about reissues too. You have to be, I would suggest people be picky, not just for the titles they buy, but some of the series they buy from, because there's, there's some out there that just aren't that great, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And then we've always, you've always had bad records being made, but. There's certain series that are really good and certain that, that just are, are not good. And mm -hmm. it's, it is what it is. The other nice thing I think for me with like the, I'd say the tone poets, the classics, the stuff that like Impex does obviously. And then most of Chad's stuff. The nice thing is if I buy a $35 record with one of these, mm -hmm. I don't feel like I'm ever going to have to buy another copy of it. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. If they do a UHQR tomorrow of, I don't know, some record I love that yeah. I have a tone poet of. I ain't buying it because it's, I mean, it might sound better on your system, yeah. Danny, you know, but the, the marginal difference is to me is not, is not worth it. So, yeah. Yeah. you Agreed. know, there's that. And then the other a tip, if you, if, if someone's watching this video and they're obsessed with buying reissues and they, they're going to buy a bunch of them, wait until there's sales on these big websites. Yes. And their sales are getting more, sales. and they're yeah. getting more and more frequent, right? Memorial yeah. Day sale, yeah, yeah absolutely, now, yeah. You go on like the on these, uh, you know, the Sound of Vinyl or one of these sites. They're all they're all operated by the companies. Yeah, they have a 30, 35 percent off sale, and you get free records. I mean, if you buy three, you get one free, and that's yeah, big deal. So we that's have cool. that's one big shift for us, um, especially me. Is I hate that I'm not getting stuff the day it comes out. You know, because I really want to have it up for the channel to show, hey, here's a new record. But man, when you can get such a big discount on it, if you buy it three months later, it's just absolutely, of course, one hundred percent. Yeah. So, gentlemen, closing it out. Speaking of, did you guys bring any records to show off? Uh, I yeah, I can grab some. We can grab some. I can show. I can yeah. show one. Oh, yeah. Uh, or CDs. 
if yeah, if you're gonna cut it out, then uh, so any has to be um, how many or what? Doesn't matter. Whatever. And I'm not cutting anything out. <laughs> oh, here we go. <laughs> Let me fix All right. Well, I could I could show a record. You're sticking, you're sticking with the script, gentlemen. Because I, yeah. I gotta go up downstairs. I'm upstairs. Oh, it's so. all good, man. Take your time. It's all good. Okay. All, all good. Back. Do, do you guys have right. anything handy, Mike, Chris? I do, I do. Yeah. Should, I, should I wait until Felipe comes back, or should I just show? No, go for it, man. Do okay. It, do it. Well, if you if you tuned into the live stream last night, I've been getting into Norman Granz's uh, label. So he produced records, Jazz of the Philharmonic. He produced records for Mercury. He had his own clef label, Norgran, and then that you know moved into Verve. And I've been looking specifically for his stuff. It's generally a gap in my collection, but I got this um, OG Lester Young on Norgran. Um, this is with the Oscar Peterson Trio, which is a guitar trio. So it's guitar, piano, bass with Lester Young. And oh. these records are, are beautiful. This is the David Stone Martin cover art. Um, and then one thing I mentioned is Killer. I was looking at this Hi-Fi logo here, and it's called Munster Dummel. And uh, I was like, well, what is that? I've never seen that before. And I, I honestly was just like, is this like a German pressing or something? Like, I have no familiarity with that. So yeah. I did some research. And... Uh, so Norman Granz uh, had a sense of humor and he thought that there was like a lot of like um, like snobbery within like the hi-fi community. So he made this as a joke and Munster is his favorite cheese. This is what I read. So if somebody is out there, please correct Funny. me if this is wrong, but I multiple sources said this. Wow. Munster is his favorite cheese and Dummel was his favorite uh, audio engineer. So he just created this and he put this on all his Clef and Norgran titles. So I just thought that was... That's really <laughs> hilarious story, but really loving this early stuff. Um, last thing I'll say about it is a lot of these guys were coming out of the Ellington and Basie big bands yeah. of the, you know, where they just weren't, you know, as popular coming out of the forties mm -hmm. and he was producing, you know, uh, shows and brought them into the studio mm -hmm. and recorded them. And these are, you know, masters of the craft and originators of the music. And I don't know why it took me so long to get into this stuff, but it is absolutely stunning. Um, so I'm starting to kind of grow this part of my collection now, which has been Love really it. fun. Awesome. Very, very cool. Chris, would you pull I've out? Got, I'll describe like four records real quick. Um, that I've been, I have this habit, this horrible habit of having about 100 records like at my feet. Because <laughs> my turntable's right here and I'll just like have stuff I'm listening to. And just, it's you very hard work to go up into the collection, you know? <laughs> so I'm hoping I'm not the only person that does that. But I got a couple of these uh ECM reissues, the Luminescence series. This is um, yeah. a new high by Kenny, Kenny Wheeler. This is a fantastic record. Sounds really good. Um, I think this series, if you can get them on sale, is a, is, is a, is a good value proposition. I think yeah. at full price, they're kind of overpriced a little bit, but um, really really excited for this one. Listen to it a lot. And something we haven't talked about is new artists, really. And we've interviewed a bunch of new artists, right? Um and Felipe is all about new artists. He can talk about that when he comes back if he wants. But this came out about a month ago. It's the Mesthetics and James Brandon Lewis. And okay. this is two guys from the band Fugazi, the, the bass and drum player from Fugazi with a guitar player. And then James Brandon Lewis, the sax sax player, um, joins them on this. And I really enjoyed this because to me, this is like um, they call the Mesthetics like it's like punk jam jazz. Okay. And so with with this awesome sax player, um, so this is really good. Nice. And, and then two more. Um, this is um, New World, uh, Old old and New Dreams. It's Don Cherry, Dewey Redmond, Charlie Hayden, and Blackwell. So Ornette Coleman's band nice. with Dewey Redmond. They did a bunch of records. Yeah, this is another ECM reissue. This yep. is a fantastic record. Um, and then probably the biggest, the, one of my favorite records I've bought in the last, I don't know, two years. This is, wow. So this is George Coleman at Yoshi's. It's a live um Said he did at this Yoshi's. I can't remember if it's still around, but it was like a sushi restaurant slash jazz club. Okay, wow. and this is a this is a pure pleasure pure pleasure issue on it was on Teresa originally. Okay, the, the sound on this thing is fantastic. Wow, and very compelling music, and um, I got this for fifteen bucks on sale at Light and the Attic site last year, and they put these things on sale all the time. So, really highly recommended record here. Nice. Well, yeah, it's just some some random. So, some random so the ECM stuff yeah. is the the ECM reissue are are getting your thumbs up. Good good stuff. Yeah, but I would qualify it with at full price. I think they're slightly overpriced, and I'll tell you why. The pressing plant they're using is Record Factory. Okay. Which is not 
to me yeah. on the same level as like an even off like optimal or palace. Yeah. The, yeah. the yeah. jackets were a little bit cheaper than like a tone poet jacket would be. Okay. They're pretty nice, but they're not quite to that standard. Okay. And they're priced them at $36, which to me is that's the price of a tone poet. So yeah. Yeah. I got them on sale at, at, at one of the websites for 40% off, and I was happy with that. Yeah. Another good tip for them is if you go on Discogs, you can buy a copy that somebody listened to once for 20 bucks. Or oh, wow. Okay. So, you know, good to know. I think they're great, but I think they're slightly overpriced, which I think is happening quite a bit, actually, unfortunately, in the industry right now. Everybody's like, Our, every record's $40. I'm like, that's not a that's not a $40 package, though, man. You know what Correct. I mean? Like, yes. Oh, it's important. It, it, it I, I think the, the presentation and the packaging, it all adds to the experience, right? Mm -hmm. And, and to your point, I mean, dude, 40 bucks is 40 bucks, right? So, you know, it's, uh, you know, we're not talking about, you know, something that, oh, you know, I dropped 40 bucks on my way to, uh, I don't know, whatever, the car wash. Um, yeah. It's it's $40. These days, that's a lot of money. So yeah. the expectations and are commensurate. Just uh, talking about ECM, this is a new artist. This is VJ Iyer. Um, and I wanted to show this one just, Featuring, you know, new artists, Tyson Shuri on drums on this, who we're, you know, huge fans of. But mm -hmm. this was purchased at the Village Vanguard. We had an like a like a group go. So Felipe flew up um, to New York. Wow. I took the train into the city. My, uh, our buddy Mike Notes and Tones was there. Um, Joe Marino was there. Uh, wow. Chris from WCB Jazz Vinyl came and yeah. hung out. Nice. Um, and uh, yeah, and we got to meet them. They signed our records. So this, I mean, there. This is a phenomenal uh, trio. Um, definitely go stream this. It's really cool, and the the set was amazing that they did. So we had a really fun time. So that's nice. a new ECM. Yeah. Very cool. Felipe is back. He went to his treasure. <laughs> yeah. I, I didn't have much time, so uh, let me see. I know it was kind of unannounced. Apologies. I'm going to start. Uh, since we, since we talk chat, I'm going to, I have one chat record here. People like talk about test uh, system showing records, but this is not about system show. It, it does show your system. Don't get me wrong. But it's even though you can buy any version, cassette, CD, or uh, cassette. Whatever. Oh my gosh, <laughs> this thing is unbelievable. And oh, it's my, yeah. and it's one of my favorite records ever. Yes. Uh, yeah. that the feeling that they are in the room, yes, they are. This double 45 here, their verb series to me is the best sounding of, of their series. I have the Blue Note series, the verb series. I think the verb has a better sound, yeah, quality wise, a frequency okay. range, separation, everything, immediacy, the voices. This to me is like a record that is very, very dear. If it's in print, whoever is watching, don't have it, just go buy it, don't think about it. It's an evergreen, without a doubt. Yeah. Right. Oh yeah. And I have an OG. It doesn't. Oh my gosh. It doesn't come close. Oh yeah. 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 Chad did a brilliant job with those. Yeah. Right. Nice. Uh, I, I'm gonna show a couple of blue notes here just because you know it's my thing. Uh, I collect OGs. I collect the music matters. Uh, I, I try to get as many blue notes as I can. And I got two recently that are very dear to me. First of all, this is in shrink. Ooh. And, uh, it's it's forty fifty eight. This guy here. Oh, wow. wow. I have the music. I have the music matters. I had like um, nice uh, a seven pressing before that. And this is amazing. This is the mono pressing. Wow. Okay. Of course, the music matters has a lot more finesse and everything. But this being shrink and uh, and it's a it's a record that I, I love dearly. It's pretty much uh, um, killer. A, a Jazz Messengers record, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Killer. Love it. That's another, awesome. Another killer, another killer, which I think is everyone's favorite. Uh, I got an OG recently, an OG stereo. It's this guy here. Woo! Inventions and Dimensions. I, I, just nice. thought, I, I just think that the, the way they approach it is so creative. It's not a traditional formation, as you would expect. Yeah. And the way they they they, they, pan it and they pan and they image the stereo here, all these drums coming from all over the place. It really like yeah. engulfs you there. And his playing is so provocative, so intense, so urgent. Uh, it's a badass cover as well, right? Oh, for sure. Yeah. Right? Nice. What a score. Yes. Look at you. I love no, it. It was good, yes. It's one of my favorites. I had to have an OG. Nice. I'm going to show a couple of new releases now. Uh, this one came out in April. Uh, it's a harp 
Lisa Harpis, Alina Beshinska, and Tony Tony Kofi, Tony Kofi, the, the British uh, saxophone player. Yeah. This is an amazing combination. First of all, this record is amazing sounding record. And if you think the combination is like harp and saxophone, and there's some other additions, some other instruments here and there, Muriel Grossman uh, participates in the record. It's a really nice concept, beautiful, beautiful music. I think very uh, intriguing. It really sucks you in. The harp is really well recorded. Uh, I think, uh, you know, whoever listens to this, you're going to like and appreciate. Nice. You can get, you can get on Bandcamp uh, for a fair, I think less than 30 bucks, probably. Cover looks cool, too. Oh, it's an amazing cover. Yeah, it's like a, a, a depiction of them. Oh, yeah, oh, look cool. at that. Wow, yeah. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, she's uh, she's Ukrainian. He's British, of course. Has so many other great records. I have a couple, a few of his other records, and it's just amazing. Awesome. This is uh, um, uh, the Jahari uh, Masamba unit. If you don't know them, you should. This record is really, really amazing as well. Um, He has a mixture of like very uh, simple, uh, basic instruments and electronics as well. Uh, okay. And it sounds really good too, really well recorded. You can find those guys on Amazon for less than 20 bucks. And uh, I think nice. it's, 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 a, it's a must do because it's really, really interesting, intriguing music. Beautiful, beautiful. And that's recent release or, or that's like- Yes, a yes, that's recent release. That's their, their second record, just came out. Nice, Yeah. very cool. And this is a triple, unfortunately, it's not available in the U.S. <laughs> it's a very limited run in Brazil. Uh, it's, a, it's a show that he did at the end of his career. Uh, it's in 1998. Joao uh, Gilberto. In a, in a small theater, yes. Love uh, it. I saw that post on Instagram. That they, is found, they found those, and, uh, and it's, an amazing, it's, a, it's a really great pressing. Is a transparent record. It's a, it's a triple. It's a, it's a great, great performance. I mean, people were like always very afraid of having him playing because he was very picky with the sound, the room. Huh. If he didn't like the room, he would just step out. No kidding! Wow, yes, interesting. Yes, huh. yes, yeah, or hecklers or anything. And uh, he wow. got pissed. People were heckle. He would just step out like, as well. Among, among wow. other things, he was not a. If people think that Sonny Rollins or <laughs> Monk were hard to deal with. He, yeah, he was a genius, really? but a nut job, yes. Wow, interesting. And this is a very limited pressing, Danny. Uh, if you want one, let me know. Okay? <laughs> I'll check. Sounds and, good. And lastly, um, I think, um, I mean, I try not to stick to a format. I try to stick to, to the music. So I've been, I've, I've been working on a video about the complete series of Miles, but there's another series, the bootleg ones. Those bootlegs are fantastic. Okay. And th this is volume four. All his new parts from 55 to 75. Wow, look at that. So here you can see him like, you know. Nice. There's an amazing book here. Yeah. Wow. And I mean, new part 55, that's when he really exploded, mm -hmm. right? That, that's why he's... Yeah. And then have his other performances throughout the decades and, and showing his, his progression, his changes, his yeah. lineups and everything. Yeah. All, all these bootlegs, see, there's one in Europe, and they're, even now they're still making those bootlegs, and those are killer. Nice, yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah, are... and it just came out. No, the, no, I think we're at number eight now, eight or nine. Oh, wow, so this is number okay. four. Yeah, gotcha. Okay. Nice. They, they're getting expensive, so don't sleep on those uh, Mayo CD boxes, they are going all over the place now. Nice, yeah, nice, very, very cool, gentlemen. Yeah, it's been fun, it's been great. Thank you all for uh, joining me for this hour. Uh, look forward to seeing all the content you guys are going to create in the future. And, uh, you know, keep keep pushing. I love what I'm seeing. Uh, love your Instagram posts. Go join the Discord if you haven't already. And uh, meet the Jazz Bums. And uh, I'm sure we'll, uh, we'll connect soon in, in due time. For sure. Thanks, Danny. Thank you so much for having us, Danny. It's been really fun. Yeah. Thanks Absolutely. for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you.